uh, I just want to say thanks for sticking around. I remember when I was in grad school, I was usually at the bar by 3 o'clock on a Friday, so I appreciate that. Uh, it's funny, I'm known in de certain Detroit circles as the soccer guy, um, and that's quite humorous. One, I'm not athletic. Uh, I certainly can't play soccer. And two, if you couldn't tell from that video, Usually whenever I do like a video or interview request, I always do it at a place where I can eat, uh, much like Orson Welles. So um, what the soccer league, why, I don't, I'm not going to talk about soccer league. I'm going to talk about like why the soccer league came to be. And it's actually an extension of my block club, of all things. Um, and bear with me, there's actually an economic uh, essence to my block club and everything we do. Um, what my background is I've worked in politics uh, for over a decade now, and I've worked from all levels, from the House of Commons in London to the municipal level here in Detroit. And I think something that gets overlooked all too often is when we talk about revitalization, we focus on the big projects, uh, the big public spending projects, big corporate investments. And while this is incredibly important, um, there's still a role, especially when you talk about revitalization in urban areas, the grassroots and the community-based. Um, I run a campaign uh, called Let's Save Michigan. It's about promoting uh, urban places and people getting people personally involved in creating the types of cities that are more livable and desirable. Um, and a lot of that's community-based, what we try to promote. And I try to practice what I pe preach. And uh, if you couldn't tell from the video, I live in Hubbard Farms, which is in Mexican town, uh, southwest Detroit. And that's actually one of the reasons I started the soccer league. It was actually a marketing technique to raise a profile of my neighborhood. Now, if you have an hard time visualizing where my neighborhood is, it's, uh, I, my, my front door is about 200 yards from the entry to the Ambassador Bridge Plaza, uh, which means my next door neighbor is Maddie Maroon. And usually it's a good thing to have a billionaire as a neighbor unless they're trying to turn your neighborhood into a parking uh, or a truck plaza. So Maddie hasn't done a whole lot for our neighborhood, except he has given us a reason over the years to come together uh, and kind of formulate, um, give us a reason to organize as a community. And a couple of years ago, we got together, um, they had a Coast Guard hearing. We got 200 people, or I'm sorry, we got 500 people two years ago to come out to a Coast Guard hearing to put a halt to his bridge. What came out of that was a group of us in the neighborhood decided we need to take this momentum uh, and address other issues in our neighborhood. And one of our problems was our historic housing stock. We have remarkable homes. Problem is, too many of them are vacant, uh, and an increasing number of them was vacant. So we decided to board up these homes to protect them. Uh, that's, there's nothing unique about that. What was unique, eh, it's not even really unique. What we started doing, though, is we had a, a, a thought in the back of our mind. It's one thing to board them. What's the next step? How are we going to get people into them? So we decided when we were going to board them up, we're going to do it in a way that brands our community. So we painted them blue with white clouds, uh, borrowing from an artist in the neighborhood. Um, and the reason behind that was significant to us was HUD, banks, when they do board up homes, they certainly don't put any art to it. And that's a way to us to symbolize the people that there's a community here and there's a community that cares. Um, and also, we wanted to have a little artistic flair to like, show that this is a neighborhood that young artists are living in. Uh, and so we've done over a dozen houses. And the thing is, that was a starting point. Uh, we kind of build off of that to take on all kinds of new endeavors. And that's how you know your block club's humming. Um, this was a viaduct. I mean, it hadn't been cleaned up. There's graffiti, I swear, from like the Coolidge administration up there on the top. <laughs> we, I mean, this is straight out of like a Tim Burton set. And um, so we decided to tackle this. Uh, we still debate to this day, I think, we, we certainly applied to the city for a permit to block off West Grand. We certainly never got approval, but no one ever told us we couldn't either. So <laughs> we put our cars there, we blocked off the street, um, and it, that's a very surreal Detroit experience on Saturday morning when you're redirecting, this is a fairly busy road, when you're redirecting the 17 bus, or you're redirecting traffic, we even have cop cars swing by and no one ever questioned what we were doing. Um, <laughs> We did feel bad. I personally felt bad when the ambulance came by and we had to redirect it. But you know, um, no one questioned it because what we were doing was a positive thing in the community, and that's also, I think, something that you can get away with in Detroit. And a local nonprofit let us borrow their cherry picker, and we got up there and we cleaned it up. Um, but doing these artistic things it adds. A, I mean, this is now the gateway to our community for the most part. And while this adds artistic flair, that's not enough to actually get people into our houses. So what's turned in is. Our block club's taken on a lot of different hats. Uh, and we've now become de facto real estate agents and de facto experts on tax foreclosure and bank foreclosure. And what's come of that is since June of this year, these three homes and three others on my street have been occupied, have moved in, like some people have bought it and have moved into these homes. Um, 
and that might not sound significant, but the reason that is significant to us is in that exact same time period, these two homes are no longer on our street. They've been lost. And three other homes have been burnt. So there's a pressing issue to us that we have to do this to preserve our neighborhood. And uh, so, I mean, this funny thing is like us being real estate agents. I mean, a good number of people here in the front row, if they've ever mentioned to me that they're looking for a house, you will get your arm twisted and we will give you, and Amy's nodding her head. I constantly ask her where she is with her house search. We, my Saturday mornings, are giving tours. There's 11 vacant houses on our street, and I can tell you where each one is in the tax foreclosure process, or which uh, speculator in Birmingham or Wayne. We have speculators in Wayne. This kind of tells you where we're at in our economy of our neighborhood. But, and, and the thing here is like, I mean, this is a row house here. I'm not a real estate developer. Um, don't, everything I know about real estate development is from like season three of The Wire. But <laughs> this building here is a block over for me and I'm working with a nonprofit and a nonprofit bank trying to pull together financing to save this because my neighborhood can't afford to lose a beautiful building like this. And that's the thing, it's a selling point for our community. Um, this, this, I, the notion of community within our neighborhood, it's actually how we market it and brand it. Um, I give tours quite a bit of Detroit, and what I've found is, when, especially to college kids, afterwards, the feedback I get, it's not the stadiums, it's not the bars, the bars help, but it's not those things that like, what, draw them, it's the sense of community, the, the sense of hope that comes out of that, that they really are appealed to. And we have a long legacy of that in our community. This is uh, Clark Park. This is a park that 20 years ago, the city was going to shut down. And it was poorly maintained back then by the city, and the city was going to shut down. And the community went to Coleman Young and proposed that the community would take over the park. And to this day, this is one of the best parks, not just in the city, but you'll find anywhere. Not only is it maintained, but unlike a lot of parks, it's actually utilized uh, to a point where it's brimming with people. Um, in the summer, uh, we have softball, baseball leagues. We have youth uh, soccer leagues that the community runs that have over 300 people in it. We have this updated hockey rink. I, I don't know how to ice skate, but I help coach uh, ice hockey there for these kids there. And it's the most remarkable youth hockey league you've ever seen. It's the most diverse one, to say the least. Um, and I mean, it's the sense of community taking ownership of an asset in our community. Um, I'm having a fundraiser here in a few weeks. And well, one part of it is to raise money to support the youth hockey. Uh, the other part of it is trying to draw people to the community. So we've tried to promote this asset. And what you find is everything we're doing, there's that double, triple, quadruple bottom line. We lose track of all the bottom lines because of all the things we're trying to accomplish here. And if you go to the community now, Clark Park, most all the houses around it are vacant, or are actually occupied, sorry, um, in that where the soup video takes place. That's on a row of storefronts that overlook the park, and almost all those storefronts are occupied. And that's quite remarkable in the city right now that you see that kind of investment. And where that plays off, and that kind of mode, the Clark Park mode of community taking step, taking the effort and the initiative to redefine the assets in the community is something that Phil Cooley was talking about with the Roosevelt Park. And I won't talk too much about that, but I mean, again, this is another place where, you know, this is a potential asset, a tremendous asset. And the city, this is Phil and myself and some others have formed the Roosevelt Park Conservancy, kind of modeled after Clark Park. And this is the vision for our, the park. The city, in an age of declining municipal resources, the city doesn't have the money to do this. Nor, more importantly, the city doesn't have the luxury to have visions like this. Because if somebody in the city proposed an idea like this, they'd be laughed out of the room. Where the hell does a city bureaucrat get an idea? Where would they pull this off? But a neighborhood, can be audacious and throw out an idea and put the legwork in to try and pull this off. Uh, and why does that matter? I mean, it's about filling up these homes. Um, I mean, I've worked on policy for significant projects. I wrote the legislation for M1 light rail in Detroit. And while I believe in that, and while I believe in a lot of these big projects, in Detroit, we can't afford to wait around for those projects to come around. Because if we don't put our efforts into like filling up these houses, I see these houses and we don't fill them up, we lose them, that, that house becomes a vacant lot really quickly. And then that vacant lot becomes too many vacant lots, and we lose that block. And if we lose that block, you start to lose neighborhoods. And Detroit can't afford to lose any more neighborhoods, and really Michigan can't afford to lose Detroit. So while we wait for the big projects to happen, like there is a very real thing that's going on, on the ground that I think is very exciting, and ultimately I think leads to a more sustainable Detroit in the future. So thanks.